This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Have you ever tiptoed through the tulips? I have. It's amazing. I highly suggest it. But if you were tiptoeing through the tulips in Amsterdam in the 1630s, you would have been tiptoeing through cold, hard cash. Dutch traders in the 1600s were pretty much the wealthiest people in the world at the time, and one of the things that they brought back from the Ottoman Empire was tulips. And somehow that became a whole thing. The Dutch upper class went nuts over these things. They bred them to be in all kinds of different colors. They were all like trying to get the most vibrant and beautiful tulips they could find. By early 1637, a particularly popular breed of tulip called the Semper Augustus was selling for over 10,000 guilders. That's about $5,300 in today's money. Rich people were spending more on tulip bulbs than many in the middle class were spending on their homes. But by the end of 1637, the tulip market crashed and the tulip craze was over. This is considered by many to be the first financial bubble of all time. Today we just seem to bounce from one bubble to the next with everybody just trying to be the first to hit the jackpot with the next big thing. You know, sometimes it's things like pogs and beanie babies that are fairly harmless, but sometimes they can totally crash economies like the dot-com bubble or the housing bubble. The rise of Bitcoin over the last several years has made some people millions of dollars and inspired millions of other people to get in the game as well. And it's sparked a lot of debate. For some people it's the future of money, for others it's digital beanie babies. But bubble or no, one aspect of Bitcoin that's been getting a lot of attention lately is the energy usage. Because it's a lot. Is Bitcoin a threat to the planet, like some people say? Or is this amount of energy usage going to eventually be the thing that brings it to a halt and crashes the Bitcoin bubble? Let's talk about it. All right, so I've covered Bitcoin a few times on this channel, and chances are if you clicked on it, you have at least some kind of basic understanding of Bitcoin and how it works. And there's a million other videos out there that explain how Bitcoin works. There is absolutely no reason for me to give a detailed background description of how Bitcoin works. So I am not going to do that here. Not going to do it. But you do kind of have to understand how Bitcoin works so you understand how the energy usage is a problem. So fine, I'm just gonna cover the basics, but I'm only gonna talk for one minute, okay? Literally one minute. Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer network, so if you wanted to send money to somebody, you wouldn't have to send it through an intermediary like a bank. You could just send it directly to somebody else's wallet, just like an email. This is also why it was originally popular to buy illicit stuff on the dark web. But in place of a bank, transactions are recorded and verified on a public ledger that's kept on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now this is similar to the way that all banks use a ledger to keep track of what's in different accounts and the transactions between those different accounts, but with Bitcoin, instead of it being in a centralized bank that makes all those decisions, those decisions and those verifications are being done by thousands of people around the web. In other words, decentralized. The question is who actually keeps track of all those transactions then? This is where the miners come in. Miners are people who keep track of all the transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain and have to make sure that it's accurate. So that means they have to keep track of all transactions ever done on the Bitcoin blockchain. And they're incentivized to do so by receiving little bits of Bitcoin for their trouble. But miners also earn Bitcoin by mining new blocks on the blockchain. And they do this by solving a complex algorithm called the SHA-256 algorithm. This is basically a very hard math problem that has two times 10 to the 256 possible answers. It requires a lot of processing power. So miners are constantly in a race with other miners to complete that algorithm and earn the next little bit of Bitcoin. And basically, the miners with the highest processing power are usually the ones that win. Ah, I tried. I tried. And I actually left a lot out of that. The point is the system relies on miners to verify transactions on the blockchain, which keeps getting bigger every single time a new transaction is made on the blockchain. So the more people who use Bitcoin, the more energy intensive the act of mining becomes. It does have a bit of a scale problem. This also adds to the amount of time that it takes to make each transaction, giving it a transaction time of about five per second. For the sake of comparison, Visa conducts 65,000 transactions per second. Now there have been some innovations in crypto that speak to these problems. They don't really apply to Bitcoin that much, uh, but there are some people that also make the point that Bitcoin is really more of a store of value right now than a transactional currency, and that can kind of offset the problem. But if you do want this to be the currency of the future that frees us from the yokes of the global elites, that's a few strikes against it. But in the pro-Bitcoin column, you have Bitcoin being decentralized and peer-to-peer. -peer. There's an inability to counterfeit it. It's public and transparent, which, depending on your philosophy of privacy, this can be a good or a bad thing. And it can move massive sums of money cheaply. How much money and how cheaply? Well, because every transaction of Bitcoin is on the Bitcoin blockchain, you can look up every transaction, including one on April 10th of 2020, in which 145,000 Bitcoins were moved in a single transaction for a fee of roughly $5. That's $1.1 billion worth of Bitcoin. And that's the kind of thing that the Bitcoin bros are all about. You know, taking the power away from the banking industry and the governments that normally control currency and putting it in the hands of the people. And it's not an invalid argument. But here's the problem. 
In a way, the very mechanisms that were supposed to make Bitcoin the currency for everyone has made it just another tool for the rich. Because that original idea of thousands of average people around the world mining Bitcoin with their home computers has turned into this. Massive warehouses full of super powerful GPUs cranking away 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know how your laptop gets super hot on your legs when you're processing video or running an intense game? Yeah, thousands of those. These are not the kind of thing your average user can build, nor can they compete against. When there's literally billions of dollars to be made, people with money will use their money to make more money. And now, of course, there's an entire industry around Bitcoin mining operations. In fact, you can order a container, a shipping container filled with Bitcoin mining that you can just plug in and just start mining your ass off. And hey, if you don't want an ocean freight container filled with mining stuff, you can just build one in a Russian bunker. Oh, Russia, what will you think of next? What, a Bitcoin mining operation being run off a nuclear plant? Oh, certainly nobody would mine Bitcoin in tombs. Oh, come on! You get the point. Every kind of Bitcoin mining operation you can possibly imagine is being done, and as I was mentioning earlier on, and as you've probably heard, that uses a ton of energy. In fact, I mentioned a mine being powered off of a nuclear reactor. There are also cases of uh, coal plants that have gone offline because they were replaced by renewables that have now been turned back online and used solely to power Bitcoin mining operations. I just, I mean, think about that for a second. We worked so long for so hard to get renewables down to the price to where it's starting to actually replace fossil fuel plants, only for those fossil fuel plants to open right back up to make Bitcoin. In fact, according to the Harvard Business Review, Bitcoin currently consumes around 110 terawatt hours per year. That's about half a percent of total global electricity production, about the same as whole countries like Malaysia or Sweden. So yeah, there's been a bit of a backlash against Bitcoin for this reason. And in fact, Tesla, who famously invested billions of dollars into Bitcoin, uh, did a reverse about face like right after that and decided they weren't gonna take Bitcoin as payment anymore for that very reason. But is it really that bad? Yeah. Like everything, the answer's complicated. Not all electrons are created equally. You know, it's kind of like the argument around how clean EVs are. You know, depending on where you are and the energy mix and the grid that you're plugged into, you know, it might be dirtier or cleaner. A car being charged in West Virginia that's powered mostly off of coal is gonna be dirtier than one in California that's powered mostly off of renewables, or even here in Texas with all of our wind. And this is the question that the Harvard Business Review article is trying to get to the bottom of by looking at where these Bitcoin mining operations are, what kind of power they're pulling from what mix of energy sources in their grid, and determining how actually dirty it is from that. And according to the article, quote, in December 2019, one report suggested that 73% of Bitcoin's energy consumption was carbon neutral, largely due to the abundance of hydropower in major mining hubs such as Southwest China and Scandinavia. On the other hand, the CCAF estimated in September 2020 that the figure is closer to 39%. Those are different numbers. Now it should be said that the biggest cost for running these operations is the cost of electricity. So they are incentivized to reduce that cost in any way that they can, be it through passive cooling systems or solar or renewables and stuff like that. And speaking of solar, there's one argument that I ran across that I actually thought was pretty interesting. And it's the possibility that Bitcoin could actually be a boon for the solar industry. So it goes like this. If you wanna put solar on your house, you wanna first make sure that you're covering all of the energy consumption that you're doing in that house. But you can always add another panel or two and sell that energy back to the grid, depending on the laws where you live, of course. Well, some people are opting to take that extra energy and use that to run a crypto mining operation in their house. And one study showed that you could get a 500% better return than just selling the energy back to the grid. Now, I guess you can make the argument that it would be better used to put that energy back into the grid and make the grid cleaner overall. But I mean, hey, if it, if it gets people to put solar on their house, I would argue that's a good thing. And of course, that's an option for these large mining operations as well. I mean, yeah, unfortunately, some of these, uh, you know, fossil fuel plants are coming back online to power Bitcoin mining operations. But as the cost of solar energy goes down, they would be incentivized to go that route instead. In fact, The Verge did a deep dive on this. And it turns out that, I mean, like all things solar, you don't get a whole lot of profit back on it in the beginning, but over time it creates tremendous value. And they did this based on a, on a mining operation in Montana that's doing that exact thing. This is all assuming, of course, that Bitcoin and crypto in general doesn't just completely crash into the dirt. But I mean, I guess even if it did, you could just keep selling that energy into the grid and making money with it. But what exactly are the odds of that happening? I mean, yeah, Bitcoin crashes about as often as your grandma's Oldsmobile, but what are the odds that it just goes away completely? Is it too big to fail at this point? Nobody can predict the future, of course, but Bitcoin's highest market cap was $1.1 trillion. And by the way, that is the fastest 
any asset has gotten to a trillion dollars, including Apple and Microsoft. And it is expected that the value of Bitcoin will continue to go up because um, it's kind of baked into the system. That there's only gonna be 21 million Bitcoins ever mined. There's a cap there. And like anything else, as the more the supply goes down, the more the value goes up. In fact, sites like lookintobitcoin.com expected that it's actually gonna get up to $900,000 by 2025. I mean, I don't know about that, but. And it's also expected to be worth more because it's gonna become increasingly more difficult to mine. The last Bitcoin is expected to be mined by 2140, which is obviously a long time from now. Who knows what crypto will look like at that point? And also, there's also a question of quantum computers. If quantum computers really came online, if there's one thing they are good at, it's cracking crypto codes, which might make any kind of cryptocurrency irrelevant. Now, the other possibility is that Bitcoin might get beaten out by some other cryptocurrency, something that's based on, you know, proof of stake or proof of time that might be a little bit less energy intensive and therefore cheaper to administrate. Now, the argument against that is that Bitcoin is the first and the biggest and has such a far head start that there's no way that anything else is going to be able to catch up to it. It's the, it's the QWERTY keyboard of cryptocurrency. Of course, the argument against that can be summed up in one word. Blockbuster and AOL, and Kodak, MySpace. There, there's a lot of words, actually. First and biggest doesn't always mean anything at a time of rapid transformation. There's always a possibility that somebody could come along and do it bigger and better than you did. Of course, one of the reasons that Bitcoin is kind of the gold standard, almost literally, is that its encryption is so hard to break. That thing that makes it so energy intensive makes it also the most secure. So for that reason, it's gonna be the one that's gonna win out over the other cryptos. And there's also the fact that Bitcoin's architecture can be amended. It does seem like a pretty arduous process though, because whatever changes have to be agreed upon by 95% of miners. So good luck with that. By the way, if it sounds like I'm just arguing pro and con arguments back and forth with each other, that's because that's exactly what I'm doing. I, I have no idea where this whole thing's gonna go. Neither do you. But let's get back to the core argument of this whole video. Is crypto bad for the environment? Because it does definitely use a lot of energy, but um, so it does a lot of things. First of all, I said earlier that Bitcoin uses 110 terawatt hours per year of energy. That was one estimate. There is another estimate that puts it closer to 32.56 terawatt hours per year. Those are different numbers. But that's a difficult question to answer. There are literally millions of Bitcoin miners around the world running just as many different types of GPUs that use different amounts of energy. And they're also kind of combined with other cryptos that they're mining at the same time. It's, it's almost impossible to really figure out. Not to minimize 32 terawatt hours, that's still a lot of energy. That's as much as the country of Denmark, but the global banking industry uses 250 terawatt hours. Now for a little perspective, I looked up the global energy consumption in 2020 and it came out to around 23,000 terawatt hours. And the industry breakdown looks something like this. 77% of it is manufacturing or about 17,710 terawatt hours. 12% is mining or 2,760. 7% is construction or 1,610. And 5% is agriculture or 1,150 terawatt hours. Hell, even vampire drain from electronics that are plugged in but not even turned on comes out to 0.6 terawatt hours per year. And hey, just to ruin your fun a little more, it turns out that Instagram apparently produces 405 tons of CO2 every year, which is why I'm not really on Instagram that much. I don't wanna, I don't wanna be part of the problem. <laughs> hey, you know that YouTube uses 243.6 terawatt hours per year, don't you? I did not know that. Oh yeah, it's, it's like 1% of total global energy consumption. Well, <laughs> that's uh, great. But, 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 I mean, that's different. That's, that's different. I mean, YouTube produces something. It produces joy and entertainment and knowledge for people all around the world. That, that's, that's got value, right? Yeah, and those crazy numbers with manufacturing, I mean, yeah, of course, they're actually producing things with actual value. I mean, Bitcoin is... Well, that kind of gets to the core of the whole argument, doesn't it? I mean, the concept of value is, is, is really kind of fascinating, you know? Things only have value because we say it has value and agree on that value. Like, this is only worth $5 because we have all agreed that it's worth $5. I mean, probably a lot of those manufacturing terawatt hours were spent making things that you couldn't care less about and have no value to you. So yeah, when it comes down to it, if you see Bitcoin as a valuable asset or a usable currency, then all of that electricity is worth it. If you just see it as the next tulip craze, then it just looks like madness. 
Bitcoin uses a lot of electricity. There's no argument there. But I'll be honest, I was kind of coming into this video expecting to just tear it a new one, but now that I've looked at it, I, I'm not so sure anymore. I think the answer is a lot more complicated than just yes or no. Now for the record, I'm not really invested in Bitcoin. I do have a little bit that somebody tipped me years ago and it's of course grown in value, which I'm not gonna lie, is pretty cool. Now, whether it will be worth all that energy usage, whether it becomes the currency of the future, I don't know. It's a new technology and like all new technologies, it's the wild west out there. You know, there is a potential for it to become an environmental issue over the next coming years, but uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm willing to accept that the opposite possibility might be true. It might actually become a net positive. That, you know, with a little mindfulness of the environment, it might actually accelerate renewables and help make them more profitable. And for what it's worth, even some big players like Kathy Wood and Jack Dorsey think that's exactly what's gonna happen. So, I guess time will tell. You know it doesn't take a lot of energy though? Watching my original series, Mysteries of the Human Body on Nebula. This is a series where we take a look at the bodies that we inhabit and all the fun, weird things that it's capable of doing. Yeah, we just put the fourth episode out and one of the things that we talk about in there is teratomas, which if you don't know what teratomas are, they're, they're tumors that are made out of germ cells that can sort of turn into all different types of tissue. So it's a tumor that when you cut it open is filled with things like, you know, hair and teeth and waxy stuff. It's nightmare fuel, it's good stuff. For those who don't know, Nebula is a streaming service that I'm a part of, along with many of your other favorite YouTubers like Isaac Arthur and Real Engineering, and it's a place where we can be free to experiment with ideas that the almighty algorithm might keep us from doing on our channels. That means longer versions of videos ad-free, so this sponsor read wouldn't be on there, and Nebula Originals that you can't find anywhere else. So Nebula is great, but what's even crazier is that you can get Nebula for free when you sign up to CuriosityStream. Curiosity Stream has thousands of documentary series from some of the best documentary filmmakers around the world. It was created by the guys behind the Discovery Channel, so it's kind of like what the Discovery Channel was meant to be. And since we're talking about electricity, I can recommend the movie Juice, How Electricity Explains the World. It's a fascinating look at how electricity pretty much affects every part of our lives and determines the life trajectory of billions of people around the world. Curiosity Stream is awesome. It'll suck you in. Just prepare to binge on all kinds of nerd stuff. Right now you can get this bundle for 26% off the annual subscription, giving you a grand total of like $14.79 for an entire year for two streaming services. So if you're curious, just head over to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, sign up, you immediately get access to both. It's, it's seriously the best streaming deal on the planet and I highly recommend both services. So yeah, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, go check it out. All right, big thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are helping to support the channel with their dollars and their cents and forming an awesome community and just helping out and being awesome people in general. I got some new names I need to murder real quick. We've got Adam Myers, Palky, Blady X, Kirk Wamsley, Kerry Wong, Anthony Torres, Dimitri, Jeffrey Olson, Fikret Teriyaki, <laughs> Cole Parker, Marty Krebs, Jeremy Patton, Minja Kimja, K Casey Christensen, Philip Shane, and Shane Peterson. That was like a flippy thing there. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, um, exclusive live streams, outtakes, all kinds of fun stuff, and just form uh, or become part of an awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this one. Google thinks you'll like that. Or look at any of these others on the sidebar over here, assuming you're on your computer. If you're on your TV, I don't know where you go, sorry. But you can go check those out. And if you enjoy them and you wanna see more, uh, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. I would say to comment on whether or not you think Bitcoin is gonna be the, the currency of the future or not, but uh, I'm sure you're already doing that. So thanks again for watching. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.